Welcome to the Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School Leadership Speaker Series. My name is Dr. Cindy Lee. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, particularly the Gadigal people of the Ayora Nation who are the traditional custodians of this place we now call Sydney. I would also like to pay my respects to elders, past and present. Our guest speaker today is Ms. Jane Lyons, General Manager at the Hyatt Regency, Sydney. With a career spanning over 25 years, globetrotter and respected industry leader Jane has a long history of success in the tourism and hospitality industry. A Melbourneian, Jane completed her Bachelor of Business, Travel, Tourism and Hotel Management at Victoria University in 1994. During her degree, she completed a 12-month industry placement at the Christmas Island Casino and Resort. Between 1996 and 2002, Jane travelled across Europe and the United States. In London, she worked at the finance department for the luxury hotel chain Savoy Group. She then returned to Melbourne and joined the Langham Melbourne, formerly Sheraton Towers Southgate, where she progressed from guest service agent to assistant front office manager. For the next seven years, Jane took the next step at the historic Fullerton Hotel, formerly the Western Sydney, where she became the Enterprise Asset Manager. From there, she relocated to her, with her now husband to London. While at the Langham, London as Executive Assistant Manager, Jane assumed her dream role, the Project Manager for a partnership between the Langham and Coca-Cola during the 2012 London Olympics. After relocating to New York, taking on the role as hotel manager at the newly rebranded Langham Place, New York, and raising two beautiful daughters, Jane and her family settled down in Australia. She then became the pre-opening general manager for the West Hotel Curio Collection by Hilton. As of May 2020, Jane is currently the general manager of the Hyatt Regency, Sydney. By drawing on decades of experience in luxury and premium hotel brands, she's providing support, reassurance, and strategic thinking to help the team prepare a strong recovery post-COVID-19. Interviewing Jane today is the Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School's Associate Dean and Academic Director, Associate Professor Simon Paulson. A warm welcome to you both. Thank you, Cindy, and welcome to another Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School's Leadership Speaker Series where we get to talk all things leadership to hotel leaders from around the world. We're coming to you live from our Town Hall campus, and we would usually have a studio audience, but because of COVID-19, our studio audience will be joining us online. And given that, I would particularly like to welcome our postgraduate and our undergraduate students, and also our industry partners who may be watching us. In recent months, there has been much in mainstream media and on social media about women in leadership. Recently on ABC's Question and Answer program, Julia Gillard, Australia's former Prime Minister, spoke about her new book, Women and Leadership. Given that, we felt it timely and important to have a conversation about women in hotel leadership. And to help me have that conversation, I'm joined by Ms. Jane Lyons, General Manager of the Hyatt Regency, Sydney. Now, if you have a question for Jane, please email your question to studentfeedback at laureate.net.au. And towards the end of the conversation, I'll have the opportunity to ask Jane some of your questions. Jane, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Simon. Pleasure Look, I, to be here. I suppose a really logical place to start is, can you tell us where your passion for the hospitality industry came from? I think my passion for hospitality came predominantly from my passion for travel. And I remember as a, as a young child um, being fascinated by places afar. Um, I think that came from my mum, who um, at a very young age, um, in her early 20s, travelled from London, where she originated, um, through uh, basically overland, um, through Europe and through some places we would maybe not dare travel today, Afghanistan, Pakistan and so forth, until she ended up in India. And from there made her way to Australia. So 
I think um, from a very young age, I remember the, the tales that she told of, of her travels and her experiences. And so I was fascinated with, you know, what was outside of our, our neighbourhood, our back door. Um, <clears throat> and then I guess then in came high school and, and the, the, the studies that we do. And I loved at the time the, the commerce subjects. So um, I really enjoyed accounting and economics and legal studies. And I, I was sort of trying to figure out how do I combine that with my love of travel? How do I make a career out of this? Um, and I came across a, a course, a university course, um, which combined both. And so I embarked on that journey of, um, I did a, a Bachelor of Business in, in Travel and Tourism Management. Um, and that was sort of my introduction to the world of hospitality. Um, and, and then it took me, I guess, uh, on my journey thus far. Mm. I think that's a great, a great story. And I have to ask you, given what you've just shared with us, when you were at high school, and I'm thinking about my own experience, and I remember in year 10 when we had to do work experience for the first time, um, I did it at a motel in Port Macquarie, and I think it was called the Beachfront Motel. And I think that from that moment onwards, I knew that was it. This is what I wanted to do. Yeah. But was it the same for you? I actually did my work experience at ANSET, showing <sighs> my age, but at mm -hmm. ANSET Airlines, which of course no longer exists. Mm. Um, and again, that was my sort of first introduction to the world of travel and the mm. aviation industry. Um, and, and yes, so that it, it just opened a whole nother, a whole nother world. And then as I... Mm figured out how do you create a career um, mm. with the, the travel and tourism industry. I was, I was really thrilled to find mm. that, that course. And I suppose a, a good follow-up question is, okay, so at what point did you know you wanted to be a general manager? And how did your family and your friends take this? Were they supportive? And I suppose how important is it for your support networks to actually sort of stand beside you as you move your way up um, the career ladder in hotel management? Sure. I, I don't think I ever really set out on my career to be a hotel general manager. I didn't know that from the outset. Mm. Um, it just progressed over mm. time as I sort of enjoyed different roles and experiences and, and opportunities that presented. Um, and so, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that there was ever a defining moment when I knew mm. I wanted to be a hotel general manager, but definitely working in hotels, my, my family mm. was super supportive because they got mm. to enjoy the perks of the family and friends experiences that, are, um, that come with hotel um, favourable rates. Mm. Um, but I think probably in terms of the support network, my husband was also in the industry for, for many years. And so having somebody who understands the challenges and the, and the excitement of working in our industry um, definitely helped, for sure. Um, but yes, my parents have always been very supportive of, of anything that I and my sisters have, have done and achieved. Um, and the perks of having um, cheap accommodation and, and hotel experiences were certainly favourable too. Yes, you can't beat those, those perks. But I want to take you back because you mentioned your first job mm -hmm. was with, with ANSET, mm -hmm. ANSET Airlines. Tell us about that first job. Well, that was actually just my work experience. Right. That was my year 10 work experience okay. mm -hmm. um, scenario. But my first uh, hotel job was actually at Christmas Island Resort. So I, um, for the third year of my, my business degree, I had to do an industry placement um, and I ended up at Christmas Island. Which... Why Christmas Island? Because, you know, thinking about remote destinations, you couldn't get much more remote than Christmas Island. So, so why Christmas Island? I had actually never heard of Christmas Island before I, before I went there. Um, I was supposed to be taking up a, an opportunity in, in LA with the Australian Tourist Commission, mm -hmm. and at the last moment that mm -hmm. wasn't possible. So the next opportunity arose, and that was at Christmas Island, at that time Casino Resort. Um, so, yeah, I had no idea really where I was going, and uh, off I went. Um, and it was the best year, um, I wouldn't say of my life, but there's been many <laughs> great years since, but it, it really was an amazing introduction to the hotel industry. Um, and I worked in every department from housekeeping to human resources to the casino bar um, in that 12-month period. And I loved it. And at the end of that, the travel and tourism piece sort of fell away and hotel management was the focus. Do you know, I, I often hear this about island life and, you know, for years um, our students have, have told us that you know, living and working on an island has just been, A, so much fun, but B, they have learned so much from that particular experience. Was, was it the same for you? Absolutely. It was my first time away from home. Um, mm -hmm. It's the first time living away from the, the safety network yeah. of, of family. Um, but amazing experience. Great travel yeah. opportunities from there. Um, great friendships that I, mm. I still continue today. Mm. Um, and yes, it, amazing experience. Highly recommended. Now, 
when, when, when my students talk to me, they often use this phrase, back in the day. So I really want to ask you, what was the industry like back in the day? Back in the day. I think um, the... I guess when I sort of started my career, there were the hotel chains or hotel groups were, were sort of you know household names, so the Sheratons, the Hilton, Hyatt, etc. Um, but those hotels, in my experience, or what I sort of mm. um, understood hotels to be, um, were very you know the big box style of accommodation, very traditional, traditional um, I guess general managers. Um, but now I think with the advent of the different brands that we now have in the in the hotel industry, you know. A, catering to different travellers' needs. With the advent of lifestyle brands, um, boutique hotels, uh, that sort of has given way to a diversity of leadership as well. So I think that um, what was a traditional hotel, or what I un certainly understood it to be, um, has certainly evolved and, and different styles of, you know, of accommodation and, um, and experiences for, for guests in particular um, has certainly changed a lot. What about supervisory management and leadership roles, how have they evolved since you um, first joined the industry back on, on Christmas Island? Hmm. I think there's definitely uh, sort of more opportunities, particularly within the, the, the corporate space, within hotel chains. So traditional roles in hotels, I, I don't think have probably changed that much in terms of food and beverage and rooms and sales and marketing, etc. Um, but I think in the corporate sort of landscape, there's certainly, there's, there's branding, there's um, social media, there's e-commerce, there's all those sort of roles that, that didn't exist when I started um, in terms of diversity of, of skills and, and knowledge and, and opportunities for, for your students in particular. Given where you are now, um, and your past experience and, you know, as the, the general manager of the, the Hyatt Regency Sydney. What do you believe, and again, this is, I think, very much based on your career path, but what do you believe is a sensible career path for those aspiring to be a hotel general manager? My advice is that there isn't one path. I, mm. I wouldn't say that there's one path that you must follow or there's things that you must tick on your mm. career journey. I think it, it really depends on your individual sort of passion and what component of the, of the hotel industry do you particularly enjoy. Mm. Um, and I've certainly seen, and I have many friends and, and peers who are general managers who've come from different backgrounds. So mm. I chose the rooms division. That was my sort of career path. That's what I enjoyed the most. Um, but, you know, of course, general managers come from all different backgrounds yeah. and, and experiences. So um, d my advice is don't limit yourself to one path. Don't think mm. that because you enjoy food and beverage, this is the only way forward. You can diversify and, and cross-stream for sure. I often hear that uh, from our students where there's a belief, you know, if they stick to food and beverage or if they stick to rooms division, it will move them quicker into a, into a management or senior leader and a senior leadership role. But I think you're right, Jane, it is that all-round experience that really qualifies you when it's time to make that next step into a, a senior role within a hotel. You've got to have that you know, fundamental understanding of operational departments and that doesn't come by just stationing yourself in one particular department. Absolutely. So. Completely agree. I think mm. um, when you get to hotel manager, so depending on the, the structure of the organisation, if you sort of have an operational, um, I guess, a, an overseeing of various operational departments, whether they be rooms and food and beverage and depending on the spa and depending on what the hotel has, um, I think the more ground level experience that you have, the easier it is to, to manage and coach um, your team. Um, and I think, that, I think that's really important and absolutely diversifying and taking opportunities and not being afraid to, to step out of you know, your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. If you've just joined us, you're watching Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School's Leadership Speaker Series and I'm in conversation with Miss Jane Lyons, General Manager of the Hyatt Regency Sydney and we're talking all things women and hotel leadership. Jane, we have a program, it's an MBA, but it specialises in international hotel leadership. And one of the core subjects is your first 90 days as a leader. Now, I think we're all very interested to hear about what your first 90 days as a hotel leader was like. Can you remember your first day? <laughs> I can. Uh, I guess... I was sort of fortunate to have um, the opportunity to be hotel manager at three different properties before I became a general manager. So my first general manager role was um, actually back here in Sydney at West Hotel, um, Curio Collection by Hilton. Um, and I probably need to set the scene there in that I had 
literally just flown back in from London, so bringing my family, my two small children, um, who were very young at the time. We landed in Sydney. I had lived in Sydney before, so I was reacquainting. Um, but it was a pre-opening. So I was joining a new hotel group. I was joining Hilton for the first time. I was um, bringing my family back to Sydney and the, the children hadn't lived here before. I um, was working for a new owner, so somebody I knew but I hadn't worked with before. Um, and it was a pre-opening and I had 60 days to open the hotel. So from the minute I land in, landed in Sydney to the day we first welcomed our guests at West Hotel, 60 day timeline. So when you asked me about my first 90 days, it's a blur. Um, I think, you know, it was all about building a team, yep. um, of course. I had to find, you know, the right, the right team. Um, and then reading the hotel. So, you know, a lot of work with the contractors, with defects, checking and so forth, um, and, and standards and operational procedures and how we're going to deliver this service. And, and then launching Curio Collection, which is a new brand to this part of the world. Um, so 90 days went, went like that. Um, and it was amazing. I loved it. I loved every minute of it. It was hard work. Um, I missed my family for that 90 days, but all worth it. Fantastic experience. You're now the GM of, of one of the largest hotels in Sydney. Talk us through a day in the life. What time does it start? What time does it finish? And what happens in between? Well, it's probably not normal at the moment. <laughs> um, I guess in contrast to my first day at West Hotel, my first day um, at Hyatt Regency was very different. Um, I, it, well, obviously it's an existing hotel, so I had the opportunity to learn from my predecessor um, and I certainly was a sponge and tried to learn as much as I could because there was nothing happening in the operation. So I joined in May of this year um, and of course at that time the food and beverage uh, restrictions prevented us from, from opening any of our outlets um, and there was very, very little occupancy. So not many guests around, not many team members around. Um, and, and really very difficult to sort of immerse myself in, an, in a big empty building. Um, so I guess now progressing sort of three or four months down the track, um, an average day, uh, I'm sort of there around 8.30 in the morning and I'm finishing about 6, 6.30. Um, normally, of course, that's quite a short day for a hotel manager in a hotel of this size with you know the, the calibre of events and, and so forth that we would normally host. Um, so I'm looking forward to those days, to getting back into the um, getting back into that. Um, but at the moment, you know, it's really all about staying connected with the team. So I'm currently there five days a week, so I'm there, but my team, my leadership team are really, you know, working three days a week and that of course is across seven days. So I'm trying to um, stay connected to them and to make myself available to them with questions so that we can keep you know our three day a week you know moving fast into what would normally be a five or six day week um, so yes it's really about staying connected to the team um, there's still some team members that I haven't met that haven't come back into the business yet so um, it certainly hasn't been a, a normal start to a, a new hotel position but um, but I'm enjoying every day and I look forward to what the future brings. I, I recall my, my second job uh, back in the early 90s um, in the industry. It was with the, the Regent Sydney mm -hmm. in, in food and beverage. And Ted Wright was the general manager and uh, a renowned general manager. And I recall you know, he used to arrive um, at work at around about 8 or 8.30 in his, uh, in his Bentley or Rolls Royce, I can't remember. But it was a very glamorous car and uh, you know, came in through the front doors and up the main stairs. and. I used to think, wow, being a general manager, it's all you know, about <laughs> glitz and glamour and you know, what a lifestyle. But um, you know, as I moved up the ranks myself, I, I, I very quickly learned it's perhaps not all glitz and glamour and <laughs> actually hard work. But do you find it's a combination? So being a GM, is it a combination of, of glitz and glamour and you know, the, the social aspect of it, but then you've actually got the hard work of the role too? Sure, absolutely. Mm. And there's mm. certainly some glitzy and, and glamorous moments, absolutely. Um, and, you know, and, and some of the life experiences, you know, that I've certainly had. And, um, you know, going back to my time in London, I was fortunate enough to um, be the, the hotel coordinator for the London Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. So that gave me the opportunity to participate and, and went to the opening and the closing ceremony and, and had some wonderful experiences there. So glitz and glamour, absolutely. Um, but hard work, a lot of hard work behind the scenes, um, a lot of, uh, you know, making sure your team members are okay. I think that's that's really important, no more so than you know than ever now at this sort of in, in this um, pandemic time. So, really important to make sure that people can, are feeling their best, so they can 
they can be their best and look after our guests in the, in the best possible way. Um, so yeah, it's a, it is a lot of hard work, but and, rewarding too. And related to hard work, related hard work, Jane, what do you think are the fundamental, the essential skills and knowledge today's general manager has to have to be effective? I think uh, irrespective of what your background and where you come from, having a solid financial acumen is critical. Absolutely critical. And I think, you know, people may think that that's just... Yeah. Of course. Um, but I think too often, especially those of us that potentially came through operations, sometimes we're so focused on, on the operation, on the guest, um, on the, the, the brand standards, on the quality of, of service, etc., that sometimes if we don't focus on that financial acumen and that side of the business, that, that can sort of be lost as you progress. So I think financial acumen, absolutely. Yeah. Being able to understand a, a P&L and a balance sheet and understand opportunities to, you know, um, for efficiencies and so forth. Very important. Um, and also, I think, you know, being a great listener. I know, again, that sounds like a, a given, but being a great listener because it's super important that you can listen to your, your colleagues, your guests, and also to your owner to understand what they're looking for, what their expectations are, and to make sure you can then deliver. If you've listened and you've understood the key messages and, you know, what's important to that stakeholder, that will drive your success. You know, it's interesting, Jane, you say that. We've been now hosting the Leadership Speaker Series since 2012, but I've noticed over the last couple of years, just about every speaker that, that's been a guest has spoken about the importance not only of finance, but also of revenue management. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, even our school's industry advisory board has literally insisted that revenue management becomes part of mm -hmm. all of our programs because of how important it is to hotel management today. Absolutely. For sure, um, and no more so in this climate. Um, you know, it's the it's the right finding the right balance between rate and occupancy. It's yielding your room types, um, and and that just doesn't extend to rooms. So there's a you know a whole um, sort of a skill set in understanding revenue management in food and beverage. And for a hotel like mine of, of Hyatt Regency Sydney, that's very important. So that space management, the optimising you know your your space and yielding from it. So yes, it goes hand in hand. I think with the, the financial acumen for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a question for Jane, please email your question to studentfeedback at laureate.net.au and towards the end of the discussion, we'll have the opportunity to ask Jane some of your questions. Now, Jane, I want to now shape the conversation more towards women in leadership and then, obviously, women in, in hotel leadership. To start off with, I have a book here called Woman... Women of the Year, a collection of speeches by Australia's most successful women. Now, there's a bit of a story behind this book. It's, it's been on my bookshelf for, for a long time at, at home. Um, my mother features in this book, and it's a collection of speeches from influential um, female leaders who got together every year and hosted a lunch, and they decided to publish the speeches um, as a collection within, within the book itself. And there are some fabulous um, speeches about women in leadership uh, in the book. It was published in 1988, but still some of the speeches are very relevant uh, to uh, women in leadership today. Um, I really want to start by sharing a quote uh, mm -hmm. with you from the book. And um, the quote was written in, in 1975, and it, um, it says... I watch women who present themselves as militant, aggressive people trying to equate with the opposite sex and losing the advantage they were born with and failed to exploit that of being feminine. Among these militant ladies, there seems to be a fear that indulgence in frivolities such as fashion and makeup will weaken their cause. Their intellect becomes suspect. What nonsense! The presentation of self to the world is a statement of how you wish to look and of how you wish to be valued. We recently heard Julia Gillard, our former Prime Minister, comment that the media and society have become far more obsessed with what women leaders are wearing and how they are presenting themselves rather than what they're saying or doing. Do you agree with Julia Gillard and is this an issue for female leaders? 
it's interesting, um, the quote from Julia Gillard in particular, in that when she was Prime Minister, I was abroad. So I, I sort of missed her term in office here in Australia. But I know a lot about her personal life from the media coverage that we, we saw abroad in terms of that she was unmarried or had a partner but wasn't married, didn't have children, the, what the clothes she wore, the size of her earlobes, I think, was, was mentioned. Um, you know, I think, so that's quite telling in that I, I really didn't hear a lot about her while she was in office, about what she was achieving, about, you know, her, her policies and, and what she stood for. But more so, it's those points that you remember about Julia Gillard. And I think that's quite telling in terms of her experience. And even, you know, being abroad and, and with leaders like Theresa May and, and Hillary Clinton in my, in my time um, overseas, definitely the media focuses a lot more in terms of, of what, how they present themselves, the hairstyle, the clothes, um, than you would ever hear about on a, on a male leader. So, mm. you know, I, I agree with her and I can, I can sort of empathise with her experiences. I think, um, I think, though, to the early quote from the book about um, about femininity and, and warmth and the qualities that a female leader can bring, I think really very telling and very important um, and qualities that, that, and again, it's a generalisation, so I think all, all women are different and I don't think we should stereotype mm. uh, women either. Um, but I do think that they're, they're really wonderful qualities that we should celebrate rather than sort of feel that we need to pare down to compete with our male counterparts. Absolutely. Now, I'm, I'm pleased you responded that way because I didn't share this with you. That quote actually came from my mother, who, uh, who at the time was beauty director for Revlon and sort oh, of wow. makeup was, was her world and, and fashion and so on. Um, so I'm sure she'll be pleased with, with the response. But I also want to share another quote uh, that uh, came from 1985, from the, the Woman of the Year in 1985. And she wrote, if you dare to be yourself, if you dare to sacrifice for the things you believe in and fight for what you want, then you will succeed and learn the joy of being your own person. No longer will you crouch to fit the ancient restrictive mould, but will stand proudly tall, a human who dares to be a cause, to be an investigator, to whom followers would turn for leadership. Then indeed, can you be first can you be captain of your soul and mistress of your fate? Considering this statement and in relation to your career, is there a comparison to be made? I, I mean, I certainly don't see myself as a maverick. I, don't, I never ever intended to set out to, you know, to break a mould or, or anything of that nature. But I think what I, I did know from a very sort of young age is that I wanted to have a career, but I also wanted to have a family. Um, and I was not prepared to sacrifice one for the other. So um, definitely I had to make some decisions along the way um, and some choices. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, supported by an amazing husband who very much has partnered me along the way. Um, but yeah, I think at times, yes, we might have to sacrifice something um, if, if we have, I guess, goals that potentially, are, you know, you can align. They don't necessarily need to be competing goals. Um, and so, yeah, but I, you know, I always tell, you know, I have some amazing um, team members now that um, young women who, who sort of look to me and say, you know, but I really want to have children. I say, great, have children. <laughs> but I really want to be a GM. Great, do that too. But, you know, and they have to figure out the right balance and, and what works for them. And everyone's different and, and everyone will, will forge their path in, a, in their own way. But um, I, I just, I, I feel very passionate about that, about setting that example for women that, that you can, you can have both. You don't have to choose one or the other. And, um, and I think that's a really important message. I think it is an important message that you can have both. But again, I, I read in what you're saying, and I'm sorry, I hear in what you're saying, that it's important to really start to think about what that path is going to look like and what you do want out of that journey and path and then start to construct the stepping stones as to how you're going to achieve it, how you're going to get there, and you know, what's going to happen at a certain time. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and you can't always plan it. You don't know when you're going to meet, no. the, when you're going to meet the potential partner in life. Um, but also, you know, I think, I think we should it really encourage particularly young women to, to take opportunities as, as they present. And if your course changes, that's okay. You know, if, if you... I mean, I, I can certainly reflect on, on my journey in that, um, you know, I was on a career path with, with Starwood at the time um, and I was selected for the High Potential General Manager Program. 
Um, and I, I really had a quandary because in my mind at that time, I thought that if I was going to follow that path and become a general manager, that I would then need to go to a second or third tier city somewhere in Asia, mm. that that was the path that my male counterparts had sort of followed. Mm. And I wasn't really sure if I was going to meet my husband there, if how was I going to you know, make this happen. And I really considered not taking that opportunity. And you didn't? Well, I didn't go to Asia, but um, <laughs> but I did. I had an amazing general manager yes, at yeah. the time, mm. Um, mm. a male who sat me down and said, "So, mm. are you ready to get married and have children tomorrow?" And I said, "No." And he said, "Well, why wouldn't you take this opportunity and just continue along and see where life takes you?" Mm. Mm. And it was the best advice he ever gave me. And I did complete that um, that opportunity with Starwood, and then and then sure enough, my path changed and I, I moved to London. Mm. But um, you know, I, I really value that that um, that advice that he gave me. And you also mentioned your, your, your husband your, um, was in, in hospitality mm -hmm. too. So. Yes, yes. So he was a chief concierge for many years. Oh, okay. um, so <laughs> very much in, in operations. Um, mm -hmm. and, and actually it was his opportunity that took us from Sydney to London in the first, op in the first place. So mm -hmm. um, I followed him and then he followed me to New York. And so, you know, we, we've certainly it's supported each other. Yes, mm -hmm. And yes. this has worked really well. It has, mm -hmm. indeed. I really want to narrow the conversation down now to, to women in, in hotel leadership and, and certainly reflecting upon my career, I've worked with some outstanding uh, female general managers. What do you think are some of the unique qualities or attributes a woman can bring to hotel leadership? I, I too have worked with some amazing female um, mentors. Uh, but they had very different leadership styles, and I, I hope that I've adapted some of their of their qualities. Um, and again, I, I think, like we said before, I, I'm reticent to pigeonhole women into sort of these boxes or leadership qualities that I think we we expect them to have. Um, but I do think, you know, we just we naturally have that warmth and that femininity, and we've had different life experiences to our male counterparts, just because we just have, and we might have come from very different backgrounds, but we see the world from a different perspective. And I think that's really important. And that's that sort of, um, I guess, diversity of thought and ideas that if we can bring that to the boardroom table in, in a hotel and and look at the, you know, the different possibilities that come with it, I think it's really powerful. But I think women as leaders don't need to be a particular form. I think they can take many different, many different styles and, and, and many different strengths. Um, and they too will lead in, in a way different to men. I love what you said about the, the, the warmth um, that a, a female leader can bring to the role. And it reminds me, you know, there is so much um, noise at the moment around the importance of guest experience mm -hmm. and really, you know, um, identifying a hotel's, you know, unique value proposition or unique uh, proposition based on the guest experience itself. And you know, guest experience is really all about the intangibles, about the service. Certainly in all of our programs now, guest experience features in, in quite a few subjects that we mm -hmm. offer because you know, we believe and the industry believes it's important. But then of course you've got that relationship between service, warmth, and creating these unique guest experiences. So do you also see that connection between you know, the, the warmth and the importance of that warmth into shaping and then encouraging the rest of your team as to how to create these unique guest experiences? Absolutely, and I think um, warmth potentially goes hand in hand with care and mm. genuine mm. sort of empathy, which is a word we use a lot yeah. in our industry. Um, <laughs> But I think it's true. I think it, it very much is um, about how, how we want to make the guest feel. Yes. So yeah. what, it, what do we want the guest to take away with them after they've stayed in our, in our establishment? So um, definitely, I think that it is that warm, but it's genuine. It's got to be that genuine sort of hospitality and the care that, that this guest that's, you know, that's chosen our hotel mm -hmm. is, um, you know, is leaving with an amazing experience that we've really made them feel special and cared for. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I've got some some wonderful general manager friends, male general manager friends, who do that very well yeah. also. So I don't think it's necessarily unique to, to females, mm. but I think, um, I guess we bring a, a different touch. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Before our conversation, I did a little bit of research around women in leadership and I, I really tried to identify what are some of the words that keep appearing time and time again that relate to you know, discussions, conversations about um, women in leadership. And some of these words are the ones that appeared constantly. 
equality and diversity, confidence, speaking up, socialization, trusting their own decisions, promotion, and the glass ceiling. These generally came under the umbrella of substantive issues for women in the workplace. Have hotels shown best practice or leadership toward addressing these issues, or is there still a way to go? I think there's a bit of both. I think yeah. that hotels, uh, hotel companies have certainly um, evolved in their thinking, and I think that they have, um, you know, certainly supported women, and, and, and we all talk about diversity and opportunity and, and so forth. Um, but the fact, I guess, that we still have to have women in leadership programs or, um, and, and most hotel groups have them now in some way, shape or form, I think is still telling that we've got a long way to go. Until we, there isn't a need to have special leadership programs for women, um, I think, yeah, we've still got some work to do in that area. Do you think, uh, and, and this sort of it takes me back to when I was a student and often you know, in the leadership course, the glass ceiling was referred to. Do you think that still exists in hotels today? Uh, I, wouldn't, I don't so much think of the glass ceiling, but I do certainly look at the, the imbalance, I guess, between the numbers of male and, and female general managers. And um, that, that could come down to, to the female, mm. some of the words that you used before, having the confidence, feeling you know, that they can be promoted, that they can strive for those, for those goals. So it's, I don't necessarily think that it's something that the hotel establishment has put in place mm. in some instances. It could come down to the fact that we just need to give women a bit more confidence mm. that you can achieve this, you, yeah. you know, that opportunity is there. Mm. Um, and so I think there's, it's quite a complex issue. I think there's a lot that can be done. If you had to narrow down to one particular area you believe hotels actually have excelled in, in, in women in leadership, mm -hmm. what would it be? Mentoring. Mentoring. I think mm. the, you can't underestimate the importance of mentoring and whether it be, it, it doesn't have to be females mm. mentoring females, it can be females mentoring males or males mentoring females. Um, I, I think just sharing your life experiences, sharing stories, mm. um, being sort of, um, I guess, thick skinned enough to, to ask and solicit feedback, you know, tell me how mm. I, tell me how I can do better, tell me, you know, what I could have done differently in that situation. I think mm. being open to feedback and, um, and really learning from our mentors and it may be females who forge that path before us and, and to your earlier point about the, the wonderful female general managers that you've mm. worked with, mm. you know, I too and I, I'm fortunate enough to have a mentor who's still in my life who, um, who was mm. definitely a sort of a um, ahead of her time in terms of female general managers and I, I, I still am in touch with her every day. Well, not every day, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but, you know, regularly to, to sort of learn from her and, and to bounce ideas off her. So It's interesting you use the word mentoring because it certainly seems um, in the last few years, not only in our industry, in, in hotel hospitality and tourism, but beyond our industry, mentor and, mentoring and coaching has become such an important component of, of leadership. I know at, uh, at Torrens University Australia, to which our school is a, a part of, we believe so strongly in this. We've developed a, a program, which is our success coach program, and our students have a success coach, which is really you know, their mentor and you know, the role of the success coaches help our students not only prepare for their academic journey, but also prepare for their, uh, for their careers. And we believe, you know, it's so this mentoring coaching role is so important to a student's progression and then their you know, final leap into their careers and, and into industry. But it certainly seems from what you're sharing with oh. us, mentoring and coaching you know, is, a, is a critical role for effective leadership in, in hotels and beyond hotels. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, and it doesn't stop when you become a general manager. No, I think, no. you know, having mentors throughout your life, and, and they can be family yeah. members. I mean, it doesn't have to be a professional yeah. mentor, but I think um, the importance of learning from others and, yeah. and those that have gone before us is, is mm -hmm. critical. Mm -hmm. And if you have a question for Jane, please email your question to studentfeedback at laureate.net.au and shortly we'll have the opportunity to ask Jane some of your questions. Now, Jane, I've been really looking forward to actually asking you this question, and it's about your hotel, the Hyatt Regency. Tell us a little bit more about the Hyatt Regency, because it's obviously gone through a rebrand, a rebrand considerable changes. Mm -hmm. 
And I believe there is a fabulous bar on the roof. Amazing. And, you know, every time I walk past the hotel, even the foyer looks absolutely stunning. So tell us about the, the Hyatt Regency as a, a potential you know, employer, um, particularly for women considering a career in hotel leadership. Sure. Um, happy to talk about my hotel. Um, Hyatt Regency Sydney is the biggest hotel in Australia. Um, 892 bedrooms. 892? 892 oh, bedrooms. Goodness. Mm. Um, so... You know, with that comes the excitement, as we said, about you know the the type of events and things that we can we can host there. So we have two amazing ballrooms. Um, the smallest is 850 square metres. The other one is just shy of 900, um, meaning we can do a thousand people in theatre style in each of those ballrooms. Um, obviously not at the moment with the restrictions, but we look forward to those days. Um, we have five outlets, including the mm. award-winning Zephyr Bar that you mentioned, the rooftop bar. Um, so, you know, in terms of food and beverage opportunities and rooms opportunities, um, you know, there's a, we need a sort of a, a great organisational structure to support, to support the, that size mm -hmm. hotel. Um, so, you know, and coupled, I guess, coupled with the fact that we're, we're part of the Hyatt family. Um, mm -hmm. So whilst Hyatt Regency Sydney is, is an amazing hotel with, with many opportunities that, that women and, and, of course, men can aspire um, to hold. I think the opportunity that comes with being part of the Hyatt family and, the, you know, 20 brands in, uh, I think it's now up to 65 countries with 900 hotels, you know, the opportunities that come from joining um, the Hyatt Regency Sydney not only exist within our property, but, you know, future opportunities as well. Yes, yes, of course. Well, that, that sounds fabulous. And which leads me into our next question. No, there's no there's no question at all that it's been a very rough year mm. for tourism and particularly the hotel sector. Can you tell us a little bit more about what leadership strategies you have employed to lead your hotel and team uh, through this very rough period? Sure. Um, I think the toughest thing for the team at the moment is uncertainty. Mm. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about wish we had a crystal ball, wish we knew, mm. you know, when, when this course. pandemic would end and when we were, could get back to, to welcoming guests. Um, and unfortunately, of course, no one knows that. So um, I think the most important thing at the moment is to provide reassurance. So in terms of um, safety is, is critical and making sure that we're, we're doing all the right things and that we've got our COVID safety plans in place and that we're constantly evaluating and, and looking at, at dip, you know, new ways to, to reassure both guests and, and colleagues that they're, they're working in a safe environment, that they can come and stay with us. So um, a lot of my time at the moment is, is spent on the safety element, but also the reassurance. Um, and it, I'm, I try to be as much as I can, as transparent as I possibly can with what I know um, in terms of what, what does the next three, six, 12 months look like for our, mm. for our colleagues. Um, so, you know, I think there's, there's certainly that element of, of reassurance and, and being ready to, to welcome guests when we can. Um, but also, you know, from a, an owner's perspective, you know, our owners are incredibly supportive. Um, and, but from their perspective, of course, we need to, you know, um, very responsibly manage cash flow and, and make sure we're, we're looking out for their interests as well in these, in these troubled times. So uh, definitely, I guess, my normal leadership strategies and, and, and things I'd be doing at this time of year, it's, it's business plan, it's budget time, you know, when we'd normally be planning for 2021 and what does the business look like? Um, and of course, we are doing that, but uh, not in the way we, we usually would. So, yeah, it's definitely a unique time. I'm very pleased you use that word reassurance and you know, listening to our conversation we have many students who over the last few months have really been questioning whether they should continue their journey um, towards hotel leadership you know have they made the right decision and now should they think about you know another career what would you tell them absolutely we will bounce back this yes. our industry is very resilient mm -hmm. um, I think that as much as, you know, especially media coverage and, you know, there's a lot of, you can't escape it, there's a lot of talk about, um, about what it's doing to our industry. But I think that we will bounce back. People love to travel, whether it be for leisure or, or business or, um, or to meet in groups. And I, I think if you, all the industry sort of partners that we're talking to are telling us that, you know, we're really over these virtual meetings and we really want to, can't wait to get back together and we, that you can't underestimate the value of human connections. And so we will bounce back. We will. Um, I think, you know, it's just a matter of time and that's the, that's the hard part that no one can, can give anyone. And, and I appreciate from your students' perspective, you know, but when is it coming back? And that's the, that's the challenge at the moment. It's, it's interesting. You know, if you look at some of our 
early tourism scholars' literature, they talk about a basic human need being that for rest, relaxation, recreation, and so on. Mm -hmm. So that it's constantly there as part of our human needs. And of course, tourism provides an avenue for rest, recreation, and relaxation. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to even watch over the last six months how quickly the industry has adapted and changed based on um, the current situation at the time. Mm. So this, you know, very quick to adapt, very resilient, and we will come back. There's Absolutely. no question. We will probably have to change in the yes. way we do things. Yes. Um, but certainly it's not the end of tourism. It's not the end of hospitality. Sure. And it's not the end of hotels either. For sure. Mm. We've been, I mean, we're one mm. of the oldest industries, aren't we, in terms of entertaining mm. and, and housing and lodging and accommodation and so forth. So I think, as you say, I honestly yeah. believe it's a, it, it's a, in our DNA. Yeah. Um, and I think we will bounce back, we'll find a way. We might do it differently, but we'll be back. People will find a way to travel and For we sure. will find a way to look after them. There's no question Absolutely. about that. Absolutely. <laughs> so that leads me back into, into your hotel and, and you as a general manager. And I want to ask you a question around recruitment. Mm -hmm. What do you look for? And what do you believe makes an effective department head assistant GM, director of operations, you know, management role mm -hmm. within a hotel. So when a person comes for an interview and they're going for a you know, middle management or senior role within the hotel, what do you look for? Great communicator. Mm. I think, and again, it sounds like it might sound very logical, but a great communicator, somebody who can impart their their message, um, whether it be to a guest or, or to a, a colleague, a team member, or managing up. You know, we, as I said before, we obviously have stakeholders. I mean, I still have a boss. I have owners, you know, I, that I still need to be able to articulate and communicate with. So great communication skills, whether they be verbal or written, um, really important. Um, but I think the one... And this is not always obvious in an interview, but I think in terms of a quality of a, of a great leader of, of those positions that you sort of mentioned um, it's about remembering that you know to get your hands dirty to get in there and, and sometimes we're in the trenches with our with our colleagues mm. because some days are really tough in hotels um, but you know one thing I've learned is that I'll never ask one of my team members irrespective of what their role is in the hotel to do something that I'm not prepared to do myself so I think you know whether I it's stripping beds or it's washing dishes or it's it's just helping out where we where we can and where we need to. I think um, if you can impart that in an interview <laughs> through your communication skills, um, great message to get across. I think it is being hands on is is really critical in our industry. So communication, the ability to do, mm -hmm. and was there a third one? Uh, I, I, you know, you can't underestimate experience. I think if you're talking about those that level of position, yeah. you know, um, a proven track record in terms of achieving, you know, being goal oriented and achieving goals, and, and being able to talk to things that you have potentially, um, I guess, owned in terms of mm. successes um, within your past experiences. So, if you've got examples of of what you've done to to either guest satisfaction or um, or colleague engagement, or if you've got some sort of really personal experiences that where you have shown a, that you've made a difference, then that's always great to, to share in an interview as well. Mm. And that really is part of leadership, you know, making a positive difference to others. And if Absolutely. you're able to, to talk about it and, you know, explain what you've done previously to make that positive difference, well, then that just lends itself nicely, nicely to the role. For sure. Um, I think there are three great, um, you know, traits that certainly... Um, promote anybody into those those mm. senior roles, but the ability to do without a doubt. Mm. And you know, it, it takes me back to again when I was at the Regent, and um, you'll probably experience this if if any of your hotels have um, relied upon over the. Um, holiday season, cruise ships. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you'd get a cruise mm -hmm. ship uh, turning up mm -hmm. and um, two days before the cruise ship would arrive, all those who were getting on the cruise ship would be at the hotel. Mm -hmm. Cruise ship turns up, then all those getting off the cruise ship would spend two days at the hotel. So literally, you know, you had four hours to turn four or 500 rooms around, yes. move all the people down to the cruise ship and then vice versa. It was wonderful to see literally from the general manager down, and this is a large five-star hotel, mm -hmm. everybody would be cleaning rooms. Mm -hmm. 
you know. And look, there was no need for the assistant GM, the director of rooms, the rooms division manager, but they did because they knew of the importance when, you know, you have something that needed to be resolved immediately and it was a guest situation, you got in mm -hmm. and you did it mm -hmm. and you helped. And I think that is so important to hotel Absolutely. leadership. Absolutely. Yeah. And yes, I have worked with those um, big cruise ship terms. They're interesting, and, aren't they? Those oh, turnarounds. I loved it. But so they're some of my favourite days <laughs> yeah. in the hotel in that, mm. you know, being able to, you know, not look at reports and computer and, you know, but being really, as I said before, in the trenches with your team and whether it be doing bag pulls or, or stripping rooms or whatever you need to, I mean, they're some of, you know, of my favourite days because mm. you actually get to work alongside your, your colleagues and then and, and talk and, you know, have a laugh. Mm. And that's the most important thing is have a bit of fun along the it's way. It's wonderful it's about work. hotel leadership that every day is different and you're yes. not sitting behind a desk yes. or a computer yes. in endless meetings. Yeah. You have the ability to walk around the hotel, to work with some fantastic people and to really have a diverse day. Absolutely. And not many other industries or careers offer you that. 100%. That, was, mm. that is definitely one of the, the big attractors for me. Mm. Um, and I guess if you think about, in, you know, under a hotel roof, mm. there's so many different disciplines and, you know, and, and skill sets and people who, from sales and marketing to HR to finance and, and the, you know, the, the diversity in person that you, that you come across in terms of the, the team, let alone the guests. I mean, that's just a, another opportunity altogether. But... I, think, I, I can't think of any other industries no. where you, you get that opportunity to, oh. to work so closely with, I, with many I, I would agree. And even though I, I'm no longer directly in hotel management, I would not choose another career. Yeah. As, you know, hotel and tourism, anybody considering hotel to, and tourism as a career, um, they've certainly made the, not right, the right choice. And that leads me into our final question, which I must ask you before we turn to some of our student questions, because sure. I know I'm seeing some of our, the, the questions coming through now. Listening, listening to us talk about hotel leadership are our future mm -hmm. hotel leaders. As a highly respected hotelier and leader, what three pieces of advice could you offer their own leadership development journey? Uh, I think firstly, get out of your comfort zone. Um, I think it's very easy for us as humans to stay in our comfort zone, but I really believe it's only when you're outside of that zone that you grow and you learn and being uncomfortable is hard, but, um, but it's important. And I think those opportunities to get out of your comfort zone um, are readily available in hotels. So it's about putting your hand up for those opportunities as they present. Um, don't be afraid to take a sideways step. So mm -hmm. I guess um, I certainly when I decided that general manager was where I wanted to be. I, you know, I think sometimes you get caught up in the next level and, and through the rooms division, mm -hmm. front office manager, rooms division, et cetera, et cetera. You can be a little bit sort of narrow in your focus in terms of the path to become a general manager. Um, I think don't be afraid to take a sideways step, meaning that you can, you know, pivot, I guess it's a... It's a catch cry word at the moment, but pivot across to food and beverage or to human resources mm. or to a different discipline. Um, so be flexible. Be flexible. Mm. Um, and it, it's not necessarily detracting from your end your end goal. It's just giving you a, a greater breadth of mm. experience. So, um, and my last, I guess, piece of advice and something I've learned along the way um, is don't limit yourself to one company as much as loyalty to a hotel company um, is, I think, is important. And I think many great you know, general managers certainly go through their whole careers with one company, um, and I, I don't, you know, I don't mean to cast aspersions on that, but I also think that um, by changing companies and and style of hotels. So I've worked in luxury hotels, I've worked in a small boutique hotel, I've worked on an island resort. Mm. I think by sort of being open to opportunities um, has also given me a, a, a great depth of. Um, experience and, and just learning different ways of, of how ho different hotel companies operate, um, mm. different structures and, and, and different scenarios. So, yeah, they're my three things. I think get out of your comfort zone, take sideways steps yeah. and don't limit yourself to one company mm -hmm. or style of accommodation. Mm. Which is, you know, again, very important in if you're wanting that rounded experience that really does qualify you for hotel leadership. You know, a smaller boutique um, brand mm -hmm. as well as a large five-star hotel can really help you polish your knowledge and skills and your development towards those those roles. Absolutely. But Jane, we, we've got to now ask some student questions because sure. I can see some coming through. And if you have a question for Jane, 
please email studentfeedback at laureate.net.au and we'll spend the next few minutes asking Jane some of your questions. So Jane, the first question I have comes from David Addison, who's one of our lecturers at the school. And he would like to know, what do you believe are the critical steps that need to be made to open up the Hyatt Regency ballroom to business events of 300 plus again? And there's a little PS, keep well and lovely to see you. <laughs> that's very kind. Thank you, David. Um, I, look, I think obviously that's our main focus at the moment is how do we bring the business back into our incredible ballrooms? Um, and we uh, are actually hosting a heist. Um, which is the Australian Hotels um, Industry Convention yes, you are. And, and Exhibition. Yes, we will be yes. there. I Excellent. believe we're hosting a breakfast so and Indeed. talking all things revenue management, Indeed. So, which so will be very, very exciting. Yeah. Um, so we're looking forward to that. So that's on September 8th and 9th, and that's really the first event that we um, have done sort of in this um, since the pandemic. So, I mean, I guess everything that we're doing in terms of planning for, for AHIS is, is really to do with safety and what we were talking about before in terms of reassurance yes. and confidence. Um, and what the message that we're receiving from our industry partners and um, the MICE advisory board and, you know, those sort of, of calibre of, um, of individuals is really about how people want to meet. People are really keen to get back together. Um, but it's about building confidence and it's making sure that every guest that we welcome to our hotel, to our ballrooms, um, feels safe mm -hmm. and feels, you know, that they are in an environment where we take it very seriously, where we're across, you know, all the things that need to be done. Um, but that also they can have, um, I guess, still they're not losing the ability to engage and network, which is, we've had a lot of conversation about that. Yes. How, do you, how do you encourage networking in this sort of land of social distancing? So, um, yeah, I think we've, we've, we're in good shape and we're really looking forward to hosting this event to hopefully show the industry that it can be done and, and build that confidence. Now, I'm pleased you mentioned networking because our next question relates to networking and it's from Semin, who's one of our students. Mm -hmm. And they would like to ask, I have seen myself and a lot of other students lacking or having problems with maintaining long-term professional networking at work or at the school. Could you share some of your effective tips, experience on professional networking while in entry level and or leadership roles? I think the key for me um, in terms of networking, and I, I've certainly got friends, or well, they were colleagues and now lifelong friends um, all around the world. And so for me, it's social media. I mean, I, I'm Facebook and LinkedIn, and I'm not on LinkedIn as often as I'd like, but I think these are amazing tools to stay connected, and we don't necessarily need to be in the same city or you know, in the same country. I think staying connected and, and, and just taking the time every, you know, every couple of weeks to just send a message, how are you going? You know? I actually had a call, funnily enough, last night from um, a colleague that we used to work together here at, in Sydney at the Western. Um, he's now a general manager with Marriott in Vietnam, and he just called and said, Jane, how are you going? How, what's, what's happening in Sydney in your hotel? What, what's life like? And, you know, we haven't spoken for, for probably a year. Um, but I, I, I really value, you know, colleagues like that, that, um, that I can network with. And, and then we, that just opened a whole another plethora of messages and conversations with, with other people we've remained in contact with. So just social media. I mean, it's as simple as that, I think, is, um, is the way to network in this and environment. And just having those initial conversations and building up that professional relationship, just because they're in a senior role, doesn't mean you can't introduce yourselves, you can't have a conversation with them, that leads to another conversation and then obviously the relationship starts. Absolutely. But if you're not willing to take those first steps and start to have conversations with those who are in more senior roles, mm -hmm. you are going to obviously you know, find yourself somewhat challenged to build your networks. Mm. But um, Jane, I certainly agree with you in, in leadership positions in hotels, networks and connections are critical mm -hmm. to what we do. Um, I remember when I was an executive housekeeper, being able to ring up on a Saturday night another executive house housekeeper and say, I need to borrow some rollaway beds or we've oh, just yes. run out of pillowcases, <laughs> can we borrow some? Yeah. If you don't have those networks and that connectedness, yes. it is going to be hard to actually be effective in your role. So in our industry, connections are, are 
crucial, I Absolutely. think, to, to our effectiveness and our success. But they start with just conversations. For sure. Uh, For sure. And um, I know this is the first time you and I have met, and even though it's uh, <laughs> under a different uh, um, sort of circumstance, you know, I know this conversation today will lead to further conversations uh, down the line, which is, sure. which is wonderful. Now, our next question comes from Associate Professor Raker Pressbury, and it's in relation to mentoring. Mm -hmm. And Raker would like to, to know, recently we examined the Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School's mentoring program and found that our mentees were very keen on receiving emotional support by mentors. Is this something new for this generation? And how can senior managers provide emotional support to young people entering the industry? And just before you um, answer that question, it's interesting that Raker does pose the question. Our advisory board who met with us recently also commented on the importance of building resilience mm -hmm. into the younger generation mm -hmm. of hotel leaders. And I see those two somewhat connected. Mm. What are your thoughts? Emotional um, support by mentors. For sure. I think um, definitely, you know, over time as as leaders, as I've sort of progressed, we've definitely had to manage differently. I think we, you know, the the relationships that we had, um, you know, when I was at a supervisory level with a team member, um, have definitely, it definitely changed. I think the, as we get older <laughs> and our new recruits get younger, I think definitely they, they do need more emotional support. I think it's maybe symptomatic of the generation, but um, I think they're just looking for, for more. They, they're looking for genuine conversations. They're looking for us to share our experiences. And so I think, you know, when I've certainly talked with some of my younger team members and who've asked for advice, they, they don't just want to know about career paths and should I take this opportunity and then this and this. They actually want to know how I felt and, mm -hmm. and how, did you, how did that make you feel and what were... You know, and vice versa. I want to know how how they're feeling, and so I, I definitely think that mentoring is has evolved, and I think it's more about that emotional side of it, their well being, their you know, their mental health, to make sure that that they're coping with whatever pressures they're under, whether it be you know studies or in the workplace. Um, and I think I think we definitely resilience is interesting because as I have a four year old and a six year old, and I'm, I'm really keen to build resilience in my daughters because I think that's such a such a life skill, and yes, I think yes. that if we can instill that in our in our children and then in, in mm. students, and then it will certainly help in the the longer career term for sure. Mm -hmm. The next question actually comes from Jess, who's a student at Griffith University. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, we truly have a global audience uh, with our Leadership Speaker Series. So Jess would like to ask, what has been the most effective strategies or policies to empower women as leaders? Also, is there any area you would like to focus more to encourage women in tourism, for example, training? Um, you know, I think, as, as we sort of talked about before, I think we have, hotels have seen the need for supportive programs for women. Um, and I completed the Women in Leadership program that Hilton conducts. Um, and I found it very valuable. I thought it was fantastic. Um, and I was the only general manager in the room. I was new to Hilton, but um, so there were, I was in a, a group of um, you know, maybe 25 women from all different backgrounds and, and different experiences. Um, and I think, you know, what that taught me was that, you know, we've, we all have our own challenges and we all have our own experiences, but I think that supporting women by by providing the mentors, and that, that's what a lot of that program is, it's about sharing experiences and, and so forth. Um, yeah, I think really important, but I would still like to see the day when we don't need to have women in leadership programs, mm. with just leadership programs. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. I have another question from, and this is a very interesting question, it's from, from Claire, who's one of our undergraduate students. And her question is in relation to negotiation. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to negotiation skills, what do you think are the key differences between men and women as effective negotiators? Mm, good question. <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> good question. I mean, again, I think that it's not necessarily um, gender specific. I think it's, you know, everybody has their own skill set. Um, 
but I, I think it comes back to what we were talking about before mm. with warmth. And mm -hmm. I guess potentially the way that I would present my case, um, yes. if I was presenting a case, um, compared to a male counterpart, I mean, we just have a different style, just in, innately. Um, so, I, but, you know, I still think, you know, some male negotiators would pale in comparison to some females and vice versa. I'm not sure that it's gender specific. I just think that potentially we just approach, approach the exercise from a different perspective. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, Jane, we've got time for, for one final question, and I'd really like to ask this question. It comes from Dr Fleur Fallon, who's our Program Director for Undergraduate Studies. And um, Fleur asks, getting hands dirty, being able to do everything in the hotel is a good message for our students, learning housekeeping, room service, etc. You present as someone who is very well grounded. What is your advice at the end of the day? Um, how do you balance time with family, time socialising with staff after hours? So in other words, in other words that very important work-life balance. Mm -hmm. How do you do it as a successful hotel leader? I think the one sort of lesson that I have learnt along the way is to be present. So when I'm at work, I'm, mm. very, I'm present and I'm very focused on work. Um, and likewise, when I'm at home. So I find, I, you know, it doesn't mean I don't work from home. It doesn't mean I'm not checking emails in the evening. But I, when my children and my husband are there, I, it's all about them. And at work, it's all about work. So I try to compartmentalise, if you like. I try not yeah. to take it home. I, you know, I try to really keep that separate. Um, in terms of the other part of the question about socialising outside of work, I mean, definitely as a younger hotelier, a, a, you know, in, as I came up through the ranks, there was much more in terms of the social side of hotel life. So from the island life, yeah. <laughs> that was very social, um, to you know, some of the experiences that, that I yeah. had certainly before children came along um, mm. were very different. But as a general manager too, I also see a sense of responsibility in terms of not necessarily socialising outside of work with, um, with my colleagues. But you know, yeah, I think it's, it's all about it's all about being present um, and making sure that you, you really make whoever you is feel like they're the most important person in the room and that's how I've tried to live my life and, and balance my, my family with work. And um, I certainly believe that socialisation is so important to team building. You don't see it too much in the literature about you know, mm. building strong teams and how to manage teams and so on. We forget the socialisation aspect, mm -hmm. but yet it still remains so important. I think hotels do socialisation very well. You know, they become your second family and the people sure. within hotels, they are your second or adopted adopted family. Certainly, you know, my studies have been in social capital and so on and the importance of social capital. And one thing I think hotels have quizillions of is social capital. They mm. do it very, very well. So I think they're very valid points about, you know, socialisation and, and its role within hotels and its role towards team building and leadership, very important. Definitely. Right. And I think, you know, that, that's really given me a sense of, and as we talked about mm. before, in terms of lifelong friends, you know, I think that was part of the attraction mm. to the industry for me in the first place. It, it was the socialising mm. side of it and, you know, and, and making great friends and, you know, and, and going through these great experiences together. And I think that that as a, you know, when I was in my early 20s, that was certainly the number one <laughs> appeal. I, I mean, I loved coming to work every day. I loved the group of people I worked with. Mm. Uh, we loved taking care of the guests. And, um, and I think that passion really comes from just having a great workplace. And you're right, mm -hmm. hotels do it very well. Let me ask you, are you still in contact with, with folks that you um, worked with on Christmas Island? Yes, I am. Yep. It's interesting. Yep. I'm still in contact with folks for, from my first job and hotel too. Yeah. So, you know, you're right. Lifelong friends, Absolutely. without a doubt. Absolutely. Jane, it has been an absolute pleasure. I wish this hour didn't have to end, but it, it, it does. Um, your discussion today, your conversation has been absolutely inspiring. Uh, and I'm sure everybody who has been listening has benefited from what you've had to share with us. And you have been listening to Blue Mountains International Hotel Management School's Leadership Speaker Series, where we get to talk all things leadership to hotel leaders from around the world. Thank you for listening, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.